Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bill Squadron, president of our energy policy, and welcome to our webinar today on the topic of critical minerals. It's, an, it's a critical topic under any circumstances today in the context of the announcement about electric vehicles, yet even more timely, we have a fantastic panel to discuss this issue from every perspective, and we welcome all of you for joining us today. One thing I do want to mention um, at the outset is that if you have questions, the latter part of the hour we will use to get to as many of the questions as we can. So please type them in and submit them uh, as we go along and we will get to as many questions as we possibly can. So thank you again for joining us. And our very first um, step in today's discussion, we are extremely privileged to have Congressman Paul Tonko Democrat from New York's 20th Congressional District in his eighth term in Congress, one of the leading voices on energy issues and energy policy in the country, member of the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee, the ranking member of the uh, um, Environment, Manufacturing and Critical Minerals Subcommittee, so a true expert on this topic, who will kick things off today with some remarks and observations um, on critical minerals. Congressman? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, and good afternoon, everyone. I do thank Bill Squadron for the introduction and uh, our energy policy for inviting me to be a part of this important conversation on critical minerals. It has become clear that a sustainable and secure supply of critical minerals is key to a successful clean energy transition. This need is driven by the current role many critical minerals play in technologies, including electric vehicles, solar panels, and of course, wind turbines. As the demand for critical minerals grows, we must ensure they are an enabler rather than a bottleneck for this clean energy transition. Last Congress, my colleagues and I worked to advance sweeping legislation to accelerate our clean energy transition, to create good paying jobs, and then to tackle climate change. We're now seeing historic investments in new clean energy projects across our country. All of these new projects, technologies, and investments have brought us to a critical juncture. We're on the brink of a global supply chain transformation that will have implications for climate, for the environment, for indigenous, indigenous justice within and beyond U.S. borders. This is why it is crucial that we work now to guarantee that critical minerals are being sourced in a sustainable, in an ethical and environmentally sound manner. One facet important for protecting human rights and upholding high labor and environmental standards is of course, transparency. We must be able to see where minerals are coming from and to where they're going. Lithium, cobalt, copper, iron, and nickel are just some of the materials essential to our energy transition. Yet each of these minerals has supply chains with environmental and social footprints that often go unmeasured and undetected. Transparency will not only help us make certain that ethical and sustainable practices are being followed, but that it can also help us identify and address challenges in global supply chains that may impact energy security. In addition to bringing visibility to global supply chains, I believe there is substantial work to be done to ensure that safe and effective critical mineral recovery, recycling and reuse play a significant role in these supply chains. Recycling might, might not meet all of our projected critical mineral needs, but it can certainly help relieve pressure on those primary supplies. It is critical that we prepare now for rapid growth of waste by continuing to incentivize recycling for products at the end of their operational lives, support effective collection strategies and fund research and development of recycling technologies. Bolstering, recycling and reuse can create domestic jobs and help avoid some of the worst human rights, environmental and security concerns raised by some more troubling critical mineral sources. From a policy perspective, I do believe there is potential for substantive bipartisan work to further strengthen our critical mineral supply chains. Going forward, I hope to work with my colleagues on policies that will be focused on improving our critical mineral supply chains, including by bringing added transparency to them. 
For example, I've been having discussions with groups working on digital battery identification systems. These IDs are essentially digital labels that could include information about a battery's components, about its chemistry, its manufacturing history, and certainly performance metrics. They can help bring needed visibility to supply chains and encourage practices that will lead to more reuse, recycling, and safe disposal of batteries. A well-developed digital battery identifier and set of reporting standards could allow for the smooth transfer of useful information amongst various stakeholders, including mining companies, original equipment manufacturers, recyclers, consumers, and regulators. These digital IDs, or battery passports, if you will, are already under development, being led by partnerships between European countries and the private sector. I believe the United States can play a much more active role in supporting their development and their adoption. This is just one area that would be a low risk, high reward opportunity to bring greater transparency to critical mineral supply chains. Ultimately, critical minerals are essential to the clean energy economy, but we need to approach their production and processing and use in a responsible and yet sustainable way. Conversations like this one today are a key part of making certain that all happens. And so thank you for everyone involved today in staging this opportunity. And with that, I do thank you all for being here today and for your leadership in this space. It's critical. We've got really a, a robust agenda and uh, we need to move forward aggressively. So thank you so much and I'll give it back to you, Bill. Congressman, thank you, and thank you for your leadership on this critical issue. I'm going to turn it over to our panel in just a moment. I do want to thank all of our energy policies partners and supporters, um, and particularly our co-host today, Shepard Mullen. I'm going to introduce our moderator, Gail Suchman. Gail has had more than 30 years of experience in the energy field at the state government level, federal government level, in academia, in, in the private sector. She's now a partner in Shepard Mullins Energy Infrastructure and Project Finance Practice. She's going to moderate our panel today and introduce our panelists. So, Gail, let me turn it over to you. Um, thank you so much, Bill. <clears throat> and as I mentioned earlier, it's always, as a New Yorker, it's always an honor to um, listen to uh, Representative Tonko. He truly is an expert in all issues energy and has been for many years. Um, you'll have to excuse my voice a bit. Um, I'm, I'm uh, coming off of laryngitis, so um, hopefully you'll be able to hear me uh, and bear with me. Um, today's program is, um, is uh, perfectly timed. Um, this morning's news is a great draft, as, as Bill mentioned, this morning's news is a great backdrop for our discussion today on um, uh, critical mineral supply. The Biden administration announced this morning uh, new tailpipe emissions um, that are designed to force up to 60%, 67% of all new car sales in 2032 um, to be in electric vehicles. And that's very, uh, very impressive. And those electric vehicles are going to need batteries and they're going to need critical mi minerals um, to, um, uh, uh, for those batteries. Um, we have a wonderful panel today. Um, we have Melissa Barbanel, Director of U.S. International Engagement at the World Resources Institute. Um, Melissa is an environmental lawyer and spent almost a decade managing environmental sustainability um, at Barrick Gold Corporation and, rep and um, uh, represented the International Council on Mining and Minerals, uh, Mining and Metals in a range of U.N. negotiations. She's worked with local, national, and global leaders to transform the sector and with an emphasis on um, management systems, environmental impacts, and legal and regulatory frameworks. We have Danny Kennedy. Um, he is CEO of New Energy Nexus, which is a world-leading network of incubators, accelerators, and funds supporting the energy transition. 
NEX has assisted dozens of battery and energy storage related startups in California, New York, Australia, and India. And um, they published a report, Building Lithium Valley, about the potential for geothermal brine source lithium in California. And that uh, has begun production this year. And we hope to hear a little bit more about that when, um, when uh, um, we get into some discussion with Danny. And finally, we have Melanie um, Kenderdine. Um, she's a principal at the Energy Future, Futures Initiative and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Melanie previously served at the Department of Energy as energy counselor to Secretary, Secretary Moniz under the Obama administration and concurrently as the director of DOE's Office of Energy Policy and Systems Analysis. Melanie is going to start us off with a short presentation to present the factual framework for our discussion today. What are the critical metals and minerals essential for clean energy transition? Where do the minerals come from um, at present? What technologies need these minerals and what are some of the gaps? So with that, I'll turn it over to, um, um, to uh, Melanie. Great, and thank you so much, Gail, and thank you, Bill, and, and uh, Congressman Tonko for uh, your remarks and for have, hosting this event, and for all of the, those who are uh, participating. The, um, uh, what I'm going to show you here, and this is, I didn't fix the typo up at the top, 2022 information from the USGS about uh, critical metals and minerals upon which we are either 100% import dependent uh, and 50% to 96% import dependent. The Navy type indicates that they are on USGS uh, critical list. The red type highlights some key energy issues. So over on the left, 100% import dependent arsenic you need for solar cells. Um, uh, I would say it's not just uh, a clean energy energy technologies, it's conventional energy as well. They're tantalum, uh, gas turbine alloys, um, uh, manganese steel production. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. And uh, so you get the idea uh, uh, over here, 96 to 50% import dependent on the right, um, vanadium, uh, you use that for steel, uh, metal, uh, uh, tellurium for uh, solar cells. And so everyone thinks rare earths Rare earths is one of USGS's uh, critical categories out of 22, 23 categories. So it's way more than rare earths and, um, and have been talking about this since 2013 when I was up at MIT. So, and, and these are uh, metals and minerals on which the US is 80 to 100% import dependent and the suppliers. And, and you see down in the bottom left, metals and minerals used for semiconductors, electronic components, et cetera, et cetera. The green type indicates 100% import dependent. So uh, 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 in the upper right, Canada there, we're getting 17% of our graphite from Canada. Graphite, very important for electric vehicles and batteries. And so 17% so, uh, uh, from Canada, we are 100% import dependent on that. Um, fluorospar, 70% from Mexico. Um, a lot of our lithium uh, coming from uh, South America uh, and everyone knows the, uh, the uh, 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 Congo is giving us our uh, cobalt. Over on the far right, look at China. There's what, 10, um, 10 metals or minerals there, maybe more upon which we are 100% dependent Rare earths, we are getting 80% from China. Yttrium, 94% from China. Arsenic, 58% from China. So, so uh, an energy security concern, a supply chain concern, uh, you can see where we're getting these from. I would also add that it's an emissions concern. 3% of global emissions are from uh, international shipping. And shipping these, 3% uh, uh, doesn't sound huge, but it's very large when you're talking net zero. Next slide, please. Um, this is demand for copper. <clears throat> and copper is huge. Uh, uh, wind generation is the largest, has the largest generation demand for copper. And so you see over there on the right of uh, the left, green electrification uh, related copper demand. So this is for electrification. 
2020 total global, global copper demand was 1,000 kilotons. By 2030, China will be 1,400 kilotons alone. So 40% more than the entire supply in 2020. EU, 1,000 kilotons, the US, 700. Um, you got a copper price chart there on the right. In five years, 2017 to 2021, went from $5,000 to $10,000 in just four years. And then down in the blue box there, uh, 140 uh, million EVs on the road, according to IEA, by uh, in their in their uh, one of their sustainable development scenarios. That would be uh, if it's 183 pounds of copper per EV, 1.6 million metric tons of copper for those EVs. Global production in 2020 was only 20 million, and you are competing with other uses there. So building construction, electrical parts, transportation equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So, so just copper alone um, and, and a, a data point, uh, an internal combustion engine uses 48 pounds of copper and uh, an EV, 183 pounds of copper. So over four times as much copper in an EV than an ICE, ICE vehicle. Next slide, and this is the final one. Thank you. And, and to show you competition, Okay, and this is a reference frame, um, uh, but, but 2016, 160,000 miles of high voltage transmission lines. The Princeton net zero analysis says the U.S. will need 75% increase in transmission capacity by 2030. Okay, very close to, to where we are now. Assume 60% of that capacity is achieved with a new miles using technology to get more power onto existing lines, the other 40%, that's generous. Um, that translates into 72,000 miles of new high voltage transmission lines by 2030. There are between five and five, 6.6 6 towers per mile on a high voltage transmission line. That needs at, at five towers per mile, we will need 360,000 transmission towers by 2030. Those are made of steel, aluminum, and again, copper. So are transmission lines, the lines that are on, the, on those towers. So are wind turbines, so are cell towers, so are EVs, and so are EV charging stations. So we have a big issue on our hands. That's to give some framing for um, for uh, what we're talking about here today. Thanks so much. Um, thank you, Melanie. As we can see by Melanie's slides, this is um, not only a climate and environmental issue, this is really a energy security issue as well. Um, so before we move on, I just want to check in with Melissa and Danny. Do you have any comments on um, uh, that you want to add to Melanie's uh, framework discussion? No, Gail, uh, Melanie's framing did a very good job. Okay, great. All right, so I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna move on. I'm gonna ask some directed questions, but we want this to be a conversation. So everyone should feel um, feel uh, free to chime in whenever they need to. So let's start with Melissa, with your um, incredible international background. Now that we've seen the world's maps of uh, mineral supplies and learned that the US is greatly dependent um, on imports from other countries, what role will international coordination play in identifying and addressing the risks um, across criti uh, critical mineral supply chains? Um, for example, um, the incentives for electric vehicles provided in the Inflation Reduction Act require um, fair trade agreements for min minerals needed for batteries. Are, are the fair trade agreements, are, are they enough? Are they, they, are they the right vehicle? Do we need better multilateral agreements to deal with labor and environmental standards? Um, let us know what you think. <laughs> Thanks, Gail. Um, when I think about this question, I think kind of think it has two parts. Uh, first, the first part of the question is about agreements for supply. And when I think about that issue, you know, there's a lot of effort, a lot of uh, countries are scrambling right now, recognizing the energy security issues that you just mentioned. Um, there are activities like the Mineral Security Partnership, which includes the US, the UK, Japan, uh, the European Commission, and Australia. Uh, there are efforts, EU, US efforts, the Critical Minerals Club. Uh, we just saw this recent uh, 
critical minerals agreement between the US and Japan. Uh, there's the US MOU that it signed with Zambia and the DRC. Uh, and then there's the critical minerals um, mapping initiative, which is focused more on identifying where the mineral reserves might be. And so you have a lot of effort going on to try and figure out um, how we can work together to address the issue to de-risk or decouple from China uh, and ensure that we have a stable and resilient supply of these materials. So that's kind of the first part of the question. But hand in hand with that is what was in the second part of your question. Um, how do we do it in a way that ensures responsible mining? Um, and this question, you know, right now there are I probably am not exaggerating when I say there are hundreds of standards out there uh, that apply to the mining industry uh, when they are trying to show that they are responsible miners. Uh, there are some that are broadly accepted among a certain group of companies, um, but there is not really a multilateral mining um, agreement. Now, to get from here to there, I mean, would be a very large endeavor. Anybody who's been involved in any uh, UN treaty process knows that it is a years and years long process. Um, I don't know that I believe that that's the most efficient or effective way for us to approach this. Um, when I think about this issue, I would like to see mapping of the different initiatives that exist out there. Um, you know, there, there's, there's so many, and right now there are folks trying to understand how they relate to one another. The uh, International Council for Mining and Metals has done comparisons of the different um, methods, although notably absent from that list is uh, IRMA. They didn't want, uh, the, which is the, sorry, the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. Uh, they didn't want to be included in the analysis, um, and they are out there um, selling themselves as kind of the best uh, method. And so we have to look at factors like whether it is feasible, whether companies are actually able to comply. You know, and then there's other questions, questions like um, how do we do it in the global south? How do we do it when it affects um, artisanal mining? Do you hold artisanal miners to the same standard that you hold a major mining company to? Um, is that appropriate? Is that the best practice? Um, do we expect continuous improvement? So there's there's so many questions in this space. I do think that uh, what I would like to see is I would like to see an effort underway to look at the standards that exist um, and that have been broadly applied um, and see what we think works well. Uh, governments, by governments creating new standards, it doesn't necessarily help, particularly if each government has its own standard. So I believe we should be looking at the standards that exist and evaluating how they compare to one another and how to determine what, what is good practice. Melanie, did you have something to add? Yeah, yeah a couple of things. The, um, the, uh, because I have a map and a slide for everything, I took China and Russia out of the equation that, of the map I just showed you what other countries are supplying us with those metals and minerals that China and and when when China and Russia are out of the equation. And I, I don't know whether they can increase production, but it suggests what, what Melissa just said, the, the need to go to the G7, the OECD, um, the, the different international associations which uh, that we are members of and work and negotiate some of those issues uh, and another uh, uh, map I have is countries that we are 80 to 100% reliant on that we are getting no metals and minerals from, okay? So they're not importing to us currently. It's not a huge amount, but a lot, and a lot of those countries are in Africa, but I think bilateral relationships and re reaching out to them would be very, very important as well. So, so and on the, the, uh, standards, I've been looking at developing a lead-like standard, a U.S., uh, it, although you could do it globally. Uh, so a lead-like standard that we have for buildings and mines are, 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 buildings are static and mines aren't. So you'd have to re-up it every couple of years, but making that a differentiator for mining companies uh, to, to mine responsibly. And quite frankly, the mining industry has a very bad, bad record. So, so a lot of work needs to be done in that regard. So what do you all think about the, um, uh, the administration's release in 
February 2022 of its uh, fundamental principles for domestic mining reform. Now they're very vague and they're very general, but they include, you know, a request, a, a requirement to establish uh, responsible mining standards, something that you've been talking about, to provide permitting certainty, um, and probably the most important is to is to establish a, a a fully funded reclamation program, which means that the basically the government is going to be funding through through um, through fees um, a reclamation. Program program to protect um, to protect against you know what we have now which is mines that haven't been reclaimed uh, if by may I would say it is vague um, and I like some of it and I don't like some of it I think that the idea that um, that we should have a comprehensive uh, environmental policy or law for mining um, outside of the environmental legal framework that already exists, uh, to me, feels very redundant, having worked in the sector and having complied with the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and RICRA uh, at mine sites. I do know that, as well as state laws, um, I do know that there's a lot of regulation already in place um, to ensure that the practices are done right and that things are permitted and everything has to be permitted. So not only do you go through the NEPA process, uh, which is, of course, slow and difficult. But then you also do have to comply with your traditional U.S. environmental laws. So I don't know that I think that's a really great idea. But also, um, there was an effort mm, five years ago um, by EPA to look at revamping financial assurance under Superfund. Um, and, you know, when I looked at that at the time, I mean, there's... Um, most of the mining right now in the United States happens in, in a handful of states. Um, and while I don't have all of the details, it, it is my understanding that there are financial assurance uh, programs in place, but they are state organized. Um, I do think that works well, whether um, something that was more uh, broadly applicable would be beneficial is, is a very fair question, I think. I do think that addressing the permitting issues to find a way to speed that up is really important. I do think when we talk about financial assurance, you know, that's for operating mines. It doesn't address the abandoned mines. Um, right now, we have Superfund for that. What we don't have, and which is also in that February 2022 proposal, um, is um, Good Samaritan laws. Uh, and if we had Good Samaritan legislation in place, it would free up uh, the industry to take on cleanups of properties that weren't theirs. It would also free up the industry, and this goes to something we're going to talk about later, uh, to look at waste as a possible resource. Um, right now, if I want to um, go into a waste pile or a tailings impoundment and I want to look for materials that are actually valuable today that might not have been economic at the time, I'm then taking on all liability under Superfund uh, for a cleanup. And so if we could pass Good Samaritan legislation, that would go a long way to addressing some of the abandoned mine site problems. Okay, let's move away from mining for a minute and bring Danny into the conversation. Danny, you've been working um, on multiple battery projects. Um, what do you see are the biggest challenges to achieving secure supply chains for the materials needed for those projects? And how are the startups managing their, their, criti their critical mineral needs? Oh, you're on. Uh, you're on mute, Danny. You have to get off mute. Thank, Thank you. you. Before I do answer that question, if I may, I'll go back to your first question. Any comments on the framing um, that was done by Melanie? Sorry, I'm a bit slow. It's early morning here on the Pacific Coast. Uh, I, I just thought, hearing the thoughts about mining policy reform and stuff, I think the the overarching framework that Representative Tonko suggested that we we look at transparency and let some sunshine into this whole supply chain conversation is really critical. The battery passport initiative that he mentioned from the European Union would really help because I think we we sort of need to start with the end in mind as we reboot here. I, I think of it as America having had a Sputnik moment. We've been bested at batteries by other countries for a decade now, more, even though much of the IP came out of the US in the 70s and so on. And we've now woken up and smelled the coffee and gone, oh, we need to do this. We need to get off these critical vulnerabilities. We need to either do it in partnership and reshore or re-globalize or deglobalize or whatever language you want to describe the reordering of our trade relations as. And when we do that, we should 
see that we could just a couple decades hence have all of it uh, in a closed loop and a circular economy. I, I know that sounds sort of extreme, but the truth is all these metals are basically recyclable. You know, with lead acid batteries, the ubiquitous technology of the infernal combustion engine era, we're at 99% recapture and recycling. So we can do this. We could build for that. You know, I know that recycling will not meet many of our needs this decade or the next, but that three decades from now, it should be doing most of it because the, the needs will have been met for the civilization to capture its electricity supply. And, and so we've got to think of this not as an infinite number of holes in the ground, which was how we were trained to think in the fossil fuel era, and rather as a finite number. It's a knowable number. I don't know what that number is exactly. Melanie may have worked that out already, but it's in the hundreds of holes in the ground that we're talking, not thousands. And, and we know where they will be. We know the ore bodies. We've mapped most of them on Earth today. And so we can sort of control for all the variables if we're intentional about this. And one of the ways to control is to be transparent and to understand the supply chain. So I think the, the biggest call to action here from a policy point of view for me would be to engage in those digital IDs and, and ways of maintaining chain of custody and, and provenance um, controls. So to your question, Gail, how are our startups in the sector responding to these supply constraints right now? We're in the very early days. This is nascent. We're you know doubling from a very low base this year and next. By the 2032 mark that we're talking about with this law in the US, it'll be a 10x sort of story. But right now, I'll be honest, I don't think too many of these constraints are being seen in like cell manufacturing lines. We're trying to get up and running here in California and West Virginia with Sparks or other companies, partly because they're also adjusting to the market realities with their chemistries. So for example, you're seeing lithium ferrophosphate take over from lithium, manganese, nickel, and cobalt chemistries in a lot of the startups that are designing batteries for automobile applications. Iron and phosphorus are much easier to access than the other critical minerals that we discussed. Um, so I would say the constraints for our startups at this stage, you know, in the first half of the decade of doing and deployment that we hear about in this decisive decade in the turn to electrification of everything for climate solutions is going to be finance and talent more than the minerals, actually. Um, money is a worry right now. If you haven't noticed, the macro is, is ugly and the inflation environment that none of us has actually lived in um, is going to change the net present value of everything we're talking about with cash flows in the out years. Anything six to 10 years from now really doesn't deliver what investors are expecting. And none of these things that we're talking about are six to 10 years before that time frame, just in terms of building a battery factory today in America. So money is a big one. And then talent. We don't have the people. We don't have the metallurgists. We don't have the electrochemists. You know, we've got one degree in this country to do, you know, the reduction of metals uh, with electricity, which is what we're talking about when we talk about processing and refining all these chemicals. Um, so we're, we've really got to think through the entire value chain, not just the raw material. Um, and the the finance for it and the talent requirement for it is what we identified in the lithium bridge project that we ran for the Department of Energy last year uh, as as key constraints uh, as much as this supply. Could you could you speak for a minute about that? It's it's fascinating. Sure. So the lithium bridge is a ongoing project program that we coordinate with New York Best, the Battery Energy Storage Technology Center, uh, and also. NATBAT, the National Battery Industry Association. So New Energy Nexus and the other two convened industry stakeholders with the help of BCG for a nine-month consultation, a bunch of great forums at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and, and elsewhere across the sort of national lab system, partnering with Argonne largely to do this, and published a report which was basically responsive to President Biden's request to work out how to fix this problem. You know, the executive order he issued day one of his administration was... How the hell do we fix the fact that we're dependent for pharmaceuticals, semiconductors, batteries, and other critical minerals? And this is our industry view as to some of the things we need to do. There's 20 some recommendations, about five of which are critical. And, you know, two are what I highlighted money and, and people as much as material. Well, where are the business opportunities um, in the US to? 
to supply some of the minerals and to undertake some of the manufacturing, the recycling, um, and um, and do we have and and do the new statutes provide any incentives for those activities? Sure, you know, I mean, since the IRAs passed, it's already led to over fifty billion dollars of announcements. You know, I mean, there may be some like the solar heyday of the Obama era, some bragger what's going on, but we've heard of you know many gigafactories being built, the so-called battery belt large recycling facilities and, and uh, infrastructure from companies like Lifecycle in New York and Redwood, you know, startups just a year or two ago that are talking about billion dollar facilities in Tennessee and elsewhere. Um, we think the um, Californian Southern Inland counties are going to become a kind of locus of this industry for two reasons. One is the lithium that is available out of the brines in the geothermal province there. So 10% of the electricity in the state is coming out of geothermal. That hot water has lots of lithium and other metals in it, zinc and so on. Uh, and we've just started commercial production of that this year. Very close by is Mountain Pass, which is America's only rare earth mine. Um, so that's been operating for over 50 years, but is the largest resource and most concentrated resource of neodymium in particular, which is critical to the electric magnets or the permanent magnets needed for wind turbines, electric vehicles, all of it. Um, so that province, if you will, the, the southeastern corner of the state is likely to become a, a critical nexus, partly because the auto supply chain that's just south of the border in the Maquila sector with the demand center of Los Angeles and the automobile manufacturers. There are 34 EV makers in California, of course, Tesla, but BYD just nearby in Lancaster. Actually, EV exports were the largest value two years ago for the state of California of all its exports. If you think about you know, what a big economy this is, that's a pretty remarkable thought. And we have the lithium we need, 300 kilotons per annum uh, production potential out of the Salton Sea region. So there'll be a, a bunch of states booming out of this over the coming decades done right. And then we think the best practice would be out of the geothermal because it's a, a byproduct of electric power production with no additional footprint and a very low carbon impact. Um, well, uh, uh, focusing on developing a domestic supply chain, um, uh, Melissa, what, what are the best opportunities um, for, uh, for mining in the US? Um, and I can ask uh, Melanie the same, but first I'd like to start with Melissa. You know, we have, we have the uh, the the lithium um, availability in um, in 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 um, uh, Nevada with the new Thacker Pass uh, lithium mine that's that's shortly to be approved or was just recently approved. Um, there's you know copper um, all over Arizona um, and and can can those be developed into real um, supplies um, or are we going to be dependent on the international supplies forever? Well, um, to to Danny's point um, first, uh, the California Salt and Sea area and the uh, geothermal brine uh, direct lithium mining uh, opportunity is significant. I don't know that the technology is all the way there yet, um, but it is really very promising. And predictions are that it could produce forty percent of I think it was global needed lithium if it actually pans out. So it's very significant. Um, there is, there are, there are operations. There's, I mean, since the passage of the IRA, um, you know, the thing to bear in mind and, and, um, not to contradict anything anyone said, but we, you know, we have, uh, resources versus reserves and, um, you know, what is today a resource, meaning we know it's in the ground may not be qualified as a reserve today because it may not be economic to get it out of the ground. Um, I would anticipate that we're going to see conversion of resources into reserves in the future. We are seeing a lot more exploration. I've been having conversations with folks at the U.S. Geological Survey um, who, you know, tell me that there is a lot more exploration happening now. Um, so I anticipate that there are reserves we don't know, know about yet. That being said, um, being able to convert those into operating mines in a timely fashion in the United States is challenging. I completely agree with what Danny said that within 30 years, uh, we are going to be recycling most of these materials. We are not going to need to keep mining according to benchmark minerals. By the way, they say 300 holes in the ground, not thousands um, globally. So that might be true. 
Um, that being said, I just think that there are a lot of reserves. There's a lot of material out there, um, and it's a question of being able to get them operational. I don't think that's going to be easy. I don't think it's going to be quick. Um, and so the question is, can these uh, can these facilities get operating within the seven to ten years uh, time frame to be relevant to the conversation? I do think it's possible, and I do think the projects that are already underway um, are indicative of that. I mean, ultimately, what we're seeing is we're seeing huge investment from the industry, so they must think it's possible. And I would defer to their folks about what is economic and what isn't, and what's feasible and what isn't. Um, I do think that. Um, a uh, representative Tonko's, um, you know, idea about a digital battery ID uh, encouraging circular economy is another piece of the puzzle, encouraging more recycling, encouraging less mining. Um, you know, the, the last part I would say is the DOE, for instance, has, uh, I believe they've, they've now funded a, a plant to work on using coal wastes as a source of, of rare earth elements. So there's a lot of creative thinking going on. I've been speaking with engineers in different spaces um, who are doing, who are thinking very creatively about how we could do this. I, I was talking to one engineer about this who thought that we could do, um, you know, something like how they do fracking, going in sideways instead of digging new big holes in the ground. So there's a lot of different models, a lot of creativity in the space. Uh, the big hurdle is permitting in the United States and, and getting it up and running. But I do think we have the reserves for a lot of it, not for everything. I mean, uh, you know, we probably don't have the reserves for cobalt. We probably don't have the reserves for some of these materials. Uh, could I say? Could I say on on that, Gail, and and uh, that and the uh, I, another map I have is inactive mines in the United States. I'm in New Mexico today inactive copper mines, you know, uh, all, all, all sorts of mines. And I couldn't tell from the source whether they were inactive because they became uneconomic to produce or they depleted the resource. And I had dinner one night with the CEO of Rio Tinto and I asked him about it and he said, they're all super fun sites. Okay, so, so uh, again, going back to the environmental record, but I'd like to raise an issue that we haven't raised so far and it, it has to do with equity issues. Fifth, uh, uh, <laughs> almost all the mines inactive or otherwise in the United States are within 15 miles of a Native American reservation. So, so we need to be very cognizant and bring in Native Americans into this discussion. Um, and and uh, to a couple of uh, points made by both Melissa and Danny, another big issue and and uh, is recycling. Now IEA says that only nine by 2040, only nine percent of our uh, lithium will come from recycling batteries. So so I don't know what they use and how that analysis was done. But Recycling, in my view, is it raises another equity concern I have about the United States. The uh, number one center of commerce in most small towns in rural America is auto repair. Auto repair will be going away if you have EVs. Very little repairs are required. And can we make those small rural towns make some kind of exchange and, and, uh, and make them recycling centers. Now it's not gonna be enough just for recycling for batteries, but for plastics and a whole bunch of other things, start figuring out how to transition those auto repair jobs to clean energy jobs in the transition. And, and I think that's very important. And one other point I make on standards, um, we tend to think of energy security as, as barrels of oil, et cetera, et cetera. When you're talking about energy security and clean energy technologies, uh, the metals and minerals are a, a clear energy security concern, the, the, the transporting around the world, where they're coming from, et cetera, et cetera. A critical indicator of that energy security for clean energy technologies is the lifespan of the technologies. How long does a wind turbine last? And you get very, very inaccurate assessments right now of how long those technologies last. And I think that we need a big focus, quite frankly, from the US government on how long they last in order to create new measures of energy security. 
and get some honest assessments about the lifespans of these technologies. So just a few thoughts. So. Uh, Danny, do you want to add something? Just to appreciate that um, Melanie brought up the equity issues. I think, you know, we're working very closely with the Torres Martinez, for example, in Southern California. This is one of the Cahia bands of Indians who much of Southern Inland California is their territory. They have to be intimately involved in this geothermal province as it comes up in this whole eco-industrial precinct promise or else, you know, be repeating terrible histories. So, yes. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think th this is the chance to sort of rethink. We're at this very foundational moment. We could build a grand cathedral here. You know, we could literally a few decades hence. I mean, the IEA's numbers, 9% recycling, I just don't believe, just as I don't believe their projections on solar adoption or anything else they've been dramatically wrong on for decades because they represent the interests of oil and gas bluntly. But, you know, we know we have it in hand to do a fully circular renewable energy and metals economy and we could do it right by the people who have historically been left behind by the fossil fuels economy which was this infinite business of digging holes in the ground and destroying everything and sundry so let's design for that at this stage in the decade and set the policy frameworks which start with this transparency stuff and and all these standards and and things and it's great that we're having this conversation so we're going to be um <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to be moving to some questions in a moment uh, from the participants of the uh, in the webinar, but I want to I want to ask the panel one more thing that I'm hearing. I, am I hearing that that mining should be in the domestic mining should be less of a um, uh, less of a priority, and the focus should be on the uh, st uh, the research and technologies for recycling and 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 um gleaning the critical minimal minerals from sources like geothermal and other and other things i think we need it all <laughs> you know sorry yeah 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 i I, I agree uh, it's okay. in all of the above we definitely right, need right. to be encouraging domestic mining of these minerals particularly given the standards in the ira and the obligations if we want to that tax credit doesn't go away Right. Uh, so that's a that tax credit for EVs is permanent, and that requires that for half of that tax credit, your minerals have to be extracted or processed uh, in the U.S. or a free trade agreement country. So no, we definitely want to continue to encourage domestic mining. Um, and then what you what I'm hearing is that in the in the NEPA process, just like just like. Um, uh, uh, BOEM is focusing on offshore wind. That that the um, uh, uh, the involvement of communities and stakeholders have to be done very early and and very aggressively at the very beginning of the project. Yes, public participation is critical to do this right. And really, if we want to see these projects succeed and and happen with less opposition and get through the permitting process getting communities on board, getting indigenous uh, peoples who are nearby, getting those folks on board from the get-go uh, is critical to, to driving the process quickly. Agreed. It's all um, about participation. Danny? I just wanna add the, the, you know, who's the we in this? Like, we're not gonna divorce ourselves or decouple entirely, neither from China nor the rest of the world, you know, that, that we have to think broadly about this. We've barely spoken of Canada and Australia just in passing. Those are the giants in the friendshoring conversation. You know, um, Australia produces the majority of the lithium in the system globally, most of the other metals, and it could produce much of what we need. And it could be done well. I mean, their reclamation standards and other mining safeguards are actually probably best in breed. So, you know, working with them, and China too, to clean up the supply chain that we will continue to rely on heavily here. I mean, you know, I know we're in a sort of saber rattling trade war, weird moment that we don't want to go further down the road on, but we should come back and start cooperating on all this stuff, getting this right, including, you know, not being sole source dependent on one supply chain. Obviously that's a mistake that neoliberal economics led us to, but doesn't mean we have to abandon altogether a trans-Pacific partnership mm -hmm. either. Even, even with the incentives we have under the IRA for domestic uh, production. No, I mean, I know the IRA is a, a large number relative to 
our history on incenting the right industries as opposed to the subsidies we continue to give to the wrong industries. But it's not as big as we all imagine relative to the task. We're talking a multi-trillion dollar annual clean energy transition. You know, what the European Union, what China is spending in the 14th five-year plan on the same sort of st stimulus to these industries dwarfs what the IRA will actually amount to. You know, like we're going to do more than the IRA in the next decade if we're going to catch up. And it's worth noting Australia is a free trade agreement partner, as is Chile, two major producers. All right. I hate to interrupt, but thank you all for such a great discussion. I have some questions from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. We'll start off with, um, as you all mentioned a little bit earlier, the Biden's new electric vehicle plan aims to have a majority of new cars all electric by 2032. But given the dependence on foreign sources for these critical elements, um, how realistic is this plan from the standpoint of national security? I would say it's as, as real as we make it. I mean, to the point that uh, Melissa was saying, you know, the innovation and creativity of the economy is is enormous. And we've got nearly 10 years and we can do this. I mean, EV manufacturing in this country went from 7% last year to 20% of automobiles manufactured in the US going electric this year in a 12 month period. Can we do that by 2032? Yes, we can. We do hard things in this country when we have to. We mobilized for the Second World War in a five-year period. Uh, so the answer is yes, we can, if we put our minds to it and, and unleash the entrepreneurial potential. I, I, I would say that, that uh, and I agree with Danny, yes, we can. A lot of other things need to occur at the same time. We need very thoughtful, sequenced policies for how we get to a net zero economy and, and, um, and uh, the, uh, if you look at the, uh, electricity generation in the regions of the country around the world. As I said, I'm in the, I'm in the mountain region today. It's 71% gas and coal. Okay, so we also need to focus on, on uh, cleaning up our electricity systems and, and more renewables, more carbon sequestration, um, et cetera, et cetera while we are working on on uh, the EVs, which I, the, uh, fortunately EVs are more efficient than, than internal combustion engines. So you get an additional benefit anyway. Okay, but we also need to look at how we are generating our electricity as well, so. Well, that we can discuss that, how we generate our electricity in another um, webinar, which would last about 10, 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> but um, especially when the conversation turns to carbon sequestration. Do we have any, so um, do we have other questions? Yes, yeah, I'll keep going. Thank you, here. all right. Yeah, thank you. Um, so on mineral recycling, what's the status of current critical mineral recycling options at the end of life of renewable energy products? And what do you think um, the role of secondary sources like drawing minerals from coal waste or acid mine drainage will play in the coming decades as a source of critical minerals? I, Danny, you want to go first? I can talk a little bit about the, the state of play. I mean, basically, the, the bundle of technologies you're largely talking about when we get to a steady state circular renewable energy economy. So the wind turbines, the solar panels, which will dominate the electricity supply and the batteries to store them. All the component parts, the silicon, the aluminium frame around the PV panel, the wind turbine made of steel and carbon fiber, the batteries made of lithium, manganese, nickel, cobalt, phosphate, iron, etc., zinc, uh, all those things are recyclable. And we have process technologies through metallurgy to recycle them. We tend to do that in acid bases. So we use a lot of sulfuric acid, for example. We don't want to do that because it's a toxic industry. So we need to innovate around that. But there are alkaline processes that can do it. Um, and, and all these things are commercial at, at market today, actually, in other sectors and countries. Um, so I think there's a, a lot we can do there. Uh, Melissa, over to you. I think yeah. there's a lot there's a lot that can be done, but recycling uh, wind turbine blades, extremely, extremely difficult because of the increase in their size. And, and uh, so I think that that's a problem, but, and, and I would also say wind turbine made, blades are made from plastic, glass, and carbon fiber, as you said, Danny, 
you need you need um, 1700 to 2000 degrees of heat to make them. You don't get that from wind and solar. You don't get it from electricity generation. And so we need to be mindful of that as we move forward. I would say one other thing, and I, I'd like to, um, my friends at the IEA in, in, uh, in Paris, IEA was set up as a, to, to look at oil and gas security, but it's gone way, way over to uh, renewables. So it, that's, that's not their focus, so, so. I, just a couple other points. Um, I know that I've been chatting with folks in Europe on this topic, and the recycling of these critical minerals is much higher up the list of conversations that they're having than it is in the United States. It's something Danny alluded to before, and it's something we used to say in mining when you're building mines, plan for closure. Um, so when you're developing these products, we should be developing them to be recyclable. We should be doing battery IDs. Those are things that are happening in Europe already. Um, I, I don't think, I think Danny's right that we don't, we won't have the materials to recycle at scale very quickly, um, but we do have the technology and the ability, but we do need to plan for end of life, not being end of life, what used to be totally end of agree. life. Um, and then in terms of the last part of that question about the feasibility of some of these new technologies, uh, coal waste, acid mine drainage, um, I don't know of any product projects that are looking at acid mine drainage. I do think that there are some projects that are looking um, at tailings, uh, mine tailings, and also coal wastes. These projects are early days. I know that Rio Tinto actually has been doing one of these projects. It's not economic right now, um, but they are working on it. Uh, there's, there's a, I, I'm not sure what their status is. There's an organization called Resolve that's working in this space, trying to look at these opportunities. Um, you know, uh, DOE is putting a, has put a lot of research into it, and I've read the research on <laughs> what's happening with uh, coal waste as a possible source of rare earth elements. I think that it's promising. Again, it, you know, they're funding it. And so these investments, uh, whether it's through IIJA funds or IRA funds, are making it feasible. Um, and so that's kind of how we need to think about this. Um, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we know for sure. But we're seeing the investments happening and, and it's totally feasible. Um, I wanted to mention uh, and follow up to what Melanie said about the IEA. They did um, a really marvelous report on critical minerals about right. a year right. ago, and we can make that available to, um, to our listeners as well, our participants as well. I spoke to them two years ago about this issue in Paris. We, they, they've, they've been focused on it for quite a while. So. It's got a lot of information in that yeah, report. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Um, this one's mostly for Danny, but if, other, if others have ideas, feel free to chip in. Um, are you, you mentioned workforce development challenges. Are there any examples of workforce development programs that are helping prepare workers for the emerging labor demands of the critical minerals industry that you know of? And what features of these programs would you say are most beneficial to bridging this gap? Yeah, so out of the Lithium Bridge project, which I sent the report of that you can also find on the argon national lab website um but we'll circulate it after this the main recommendation to the federal government is get proactive on workforce development doe has a number of initiatives that are quite um healthy and and you know growing rapidly i would say so we've we're running this workforce development committee um, with the national labs and vocational colleges and universities across the country trying to build particularly the sort of two-year degree courses rather than the four-year and master's and PhDs. We've sort of got a dearth of all of it, but particularly the sort of the entry level and, and um, you know, great jobs that can be had across these industries. You know, this is in processing minerals out of mines or direct lithium extraction from brines, uh, refining them into active cathode materials and the like, precursor chemistries into battery cell manufacture and then beyond cathodes, anodes, et cetera. Uh, all those need bodies on the line, whether they're automated factories or not, they'll they'll need lots of well-trained people, hundreds of thousands, as I said, we're just starting to design for those. One great thing, again, to the Europeans being ahead of us on this whole conversation, they have had through the European Battery Alliance, a, a development of, I think, some dozens of courses and curricula ranging across that spectrum of jobs and, and work required 
they've translated that themselves into their 27 nation national languages or whatever it is and they've offered that holus bolus to the us and allies um as an open source asset so we're actually talking with eba about that um you know trying to point you directly to the workforce development committee i'm not sure they're uh how to connect you other than i'll put you in touch with one of my staff vj dar who's actually co-chairing that for for the doe I, I would, if i could say danny we have a partnership with the afl cio the labor energy partnership they are obviously hugely interested in this yeah. and and somebody mentioned training needs earlier that, that you know and and they are very good at at developing training, it would be a good idea to look at what training needs there are. So, yeah. UAW and mine workers, steel workers, yeah, yeah. Um, all getting steel, involved. Steel. I mean, we might have a UAW battery factory in uh, California here very soon, right. which is really exciting. You know, I'm sorry to jump in because this conversation has been so outstanding and could continue for quite a while. I mean, the points that you all, Congressman Tonko, made about transparency, about recycling, about all of the above as part of it. And you know, I think all of these resonated tremendously. And, um, you know, Melanie, your last point, I do want to um, refer everyone on Zoom to the Our Energy Library. The labor report that Melanie's referred to is on there. There's a lot of materials on the subject we talked about today. Uh, it's available to all of you as you do your work on this subject and others, so I'd highly recommend it to you. Um, I wanna thank our partners again, our co-host Shepard Mullen, most importantly, Congressman Tonk Tonko, our distinguished panel, Danny, Melissa, Melanie, and um, Gail as our moderator. Fantastic job today, really appreciate it. For those of you that have colleagues that couldn't attend, we will post a recording of this on the Our Energy Policy website within a couple of days. Um, and as always, we thank you for taking the time to join us, please. Um, look out for our next webinar coming um, in May, and we look forward to seeing you then. To all of you, thanks again, and have a great day.